Welcome and good evening to the January 20th, 2022 board work session. I'll officially call the meeting to order. And first item of, on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, I, can draw one. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I think he was waving out on the, on the TV screen, so it's good. All right, up next, uh, Mr. Lee, you want to call roll? I will. <coughs> all right, um, Mr. Burgess. Yes. Mr. Carlson. Here. Mr. Gallagher is not here. Uh, Mrs. Fattis. Here. Mr. Swanson. Here. Mr. Lee is here. Mr. White is not here. Those. Thank you. All right. Uh, item A on the or two A on the agenda is approving uh, the agenda. So I'll take a motion and a second. To approve. Moved. Second. Motion second to approve. Mr. Leith. All right. Mr. Burgess. Yes. Mr. Carlson. Yes. Mrs. Fattis. Yes. Mr. Swanson. Yes. Mr. Leith says yes. Carries. Perfect, thank you. That takes us to tonight's content agenda. And up first is the Ignite program expansion conversation. Uh, this is for information purposes. I'll turn it over to Dr. Jones. I think it's kicked off. I don't know if you can hear me. It's turned on. This community, uh meeting is designed this workshop's designed to be a discussion um, focused around our career our professional career study program expansion um, Teresa Hudson and some of the ignite teachers will present the areas that we're asking for expansion and some of the new program areas we're discussing and then Dr. Morrow is going to talk about weighted credit, and you'll see why that's important with the discussion tonight. Teresa, you want to start us off? And, and this is very informal, so asking questions along the way or comments is completely permitted. Should be green. How, how was that? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Jones, board members. So glad to have you back. I always love to have you in our facility. And tonight we are talking about the expansion of Ignite. I have a team that's half here and half not that was supposed to be here with me tonight. So um, presenting with me tonight, though, is Wendy Broughton. She's a health science instructor. And then Dr. Richard Hamm, which is from the University of Arkansas. But online and watching is Chris Weeks, which was not able to come here tonight, and Mich Michelle McLaughlin, which is also watching, to see if you have any questions at the end that maybe they need to answer, and she, they can do that through email. So we've got a little system worked out. Let's see. Let's go ahead and show the PowerPoint, Erin, if you don't mind. I'd like to talk a little bit about Ignite. It'll come up, and if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and, and hit going over to the second slide. But uh, just to remind everybody a little bit about history about Ignite. So we're in our seventh year, and when we first started, we, we started in multiple locations. We didn't have this beautiful facility, and we grew our program very slowly, very methodically, strategically. We took our time. We made sure that that we had all the right things in place as we progressed and moved forward. So what you're seeing on, oops, maybe we go back one slide, I'm sorry. Um, let's see, there, there we go, right there. So this is just a chart that shows, shows you our growth over time. And it really, we, go, we start really with our 16 students that we had, that, that was our pilot year and that was in technology. But we have um, worked very closely with NWAC so that we can provide college credit, but also with business partners. And the business partners really make a difference in what is happening in Ignite. So presently, this is where we stand. We have eight career strands in this area. So right now, you've seen a lot of you toured the construction management program. We have culinary arts. We have digital design and photography. 
education innovation, global business, health sciences, technology, and video production. So you're familiar with most of those. You've met students in them, you met the teachers, and then you've talked to um, people before that have already that been through the program and have graduated. So also, we have students that come in the morning and then they go back to their home high school and then some that are at their home high school and then they come here. And our teachers have between 20 and 25 students in those sessions. But those sessions are for like three classes. So it takes three uh, classes of a student seven class schedule for at night. So it's a big commitment on a student's part to do this. And then also our teachers are teaching, it sounds like 20 to 25, but it's for three of their classes. And um, they are earning their certifications while they're here. They're earning college credit while they're here. And then we do internships while they're here. And again, we have three locations now. So this is one of our locations, construction management over um, by Washington Junior High. And then our culinary students are meeting at the 8th Street Market at Brightwater. So those are our three different locations. It's important to us to bring community to our classroom, provide real relevant learning for our students. And we just we have a mission and a goal that we work towards and think about as, as, a, as a group on what we want to happen for our students. So those partners support us with community scholarships. They help us with our professional equipment and give us lots of advice. So that's an important piece too. And we can go to the next slide. So we're here tonight because we're ready to make those next steps. Think about what, what are our next moves in Ignite. And just like we planned and processed all those other ones in the beginning, we think we're now in a position to, to start to move forward in some things. So we'd like to take a look at expanding our health sciences, expanding the construction management area, and adding a new strand in aviation or advanced air mobility. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So that's the three topics we have. And we're going to start with health sciences first. So our health science... Uh, strand is the most in-demand strand that we have. So that's the one that creates a long waiting list. And um, again, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, wouldn't it be nice to take them all? And it would be nice to take them all, but they, we can't provide the same experience for all of them. And that's the important piece. And that's why it is so popular. It has to do with those internships or what we call clinicals in that particular area. It has to do with those certifications. And, um, and, and that, that requires partners. And that takes a long time to establish and build. And we got to make sure they're solid. We don't want to overpromise people that when they're going to have these experiences and they come in and then we're like, oh, sorry, that didn't really work out. So we, want, we have to make sure we have things in place. And that's why it's kind of taken us a, a little bit of time. So as you can see by that chart, we're turning away a lot of students. But we think we're in a healthy position right now to possibly expand that if we look at adding uh, another FTE and also renovating some space so that we can provide some training areas. So we think that we're, we're ready to do that and we have the partners in place. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And um, of course, we love to celebrate and talk about our students and all the wonderful things that they do. But I want to invite Wendy up here. Wendy, do you mind coming on up here? So this is Wendy Broughton. She's one of two teachers here. But uh, Wendy started in 2016. So she started the program. And she's taken full ownership of it. She's empowered to do the very best that she can do for these students. And so she works tirelessly working with hospitals, clinics, the fire departments, uh, private individuals. She has done a phenomenal job. And I think everyone knows that. Um, but I always like to celebrate it because um, I feel like it's because of these special teachers that these students have these opportunities. I can't, I certainly couldn't do that alone. And um, so she's been with us since 2016, started it with, um, we talked about that today, 18 students. And here's where we are today. And uh, then in 2019, we added another instructor, Shanna Workman, and she really took on the CNA training program. And so we add, were able to add that certification in. And it's an overachieving group. I can just tell you that. They're phenomenal. They have a 100% passing rate. But, you know, that's really not heard of. And um, so she does a phenomenal job of training them, getting them ready, practice and testing. That, that week of testing, if you come by at night, you're going to see cars out there because they're coming in and they're practicing over and over and over. And the, the people that come in and test, because they, they are a national testing agency that comes in, they're like, they're just blown away. They just they can't, they just can't believe how 
um, professional they are and how they act. But all that to say, as I asked Wendy to, to share a little bit and tell the uh, tell where we are statistically in some of the workforce development that she's done. And then uh, we always like to, to talk about special students as well. So Wendy, I'm gonna let you speak. I probably should have brought my notes because I can spend all evening talking about my students, but thank you all for letting us have this opportunity. Um, like Teresa said, in 2016, we had a classroom and I really didn't know what we we're gonna do. I was telling Dr. Jones earlier, they said, what are we gonna do this year? And I said, I don't know what we're gonna do tomorrow. We didn't have a plan. I mean, it, we, were, we were winging it. And so to see how far we've come and it's all the support of, of Northwest Arkansas. Um, Mercy jumped on board in 2016 and offered amazing opportunities and then they needed to back off because other schools wanted those same experiences and that they had to figure out how they were going to manage us. And then Northwest came on, so we had our two big hospitals, and now we are so excited to be in clinics, hospitals, even with COVID. You know, we served them, we helped with screening and COVID vaccination clinics and just did what we could, but now we're back in the hospitals and um, a little a little respite from mercy, but overall. But um, this picture, Dr. Jones was in our building a couple of weeks ago, and as she was leaving, I pulled the three students who had just presented their semester-long research project. I said, I want you to, I want you to just hear their stories. Every student, I can, I could give you an amazing story, but these three, um, Reagan on the right, she's was one of our first students, and Evan on the left, to graduate with their CNA, um, their junior year. They had just turned 17, and Mercy hired them. They have never done that before. They got permission from St. Louis, where their headquarters are, and they said, these are great kids. They've been shadowing. They've been doing clinical rotations here. We feel comfortable with them. And so they, it, it was a brand new, they've never hired 17-year-old high school student in a certified position. So they were hired as the first two high school students to be CNAs. Um, as of today, because an interview just, uh, an interview just got a phone call, we now have 10 high school ignite high school students working for mercy doing 12 hour shifts on the weekends and six hour shifts during the week and <laughs> the, i have to tell you this because it's unbelievable they are starting them at 15 dollars an hour and then if they want to work on mercy day which which right now during COVID is every day so any day that they sign up for is an additional 20 dollars an hour so 17 year old students are making 35 dollars an hour so if you guys want to become cnas yeah. We have a great pass rate, and we'll take you. Um, isn't that amazing in high school? And so we've got students that um, they really want to move away and they want to go to college, but they, they wouldn't be able to afford that, and they are pocketing and saving that money. One's already been accepted to Missouri State and to the nursing program early that she wouldn't have had the finances to go afford for that. Um, so those two guys, those two on either side were our very first two, and they represented so well that we have continued to have this amazing employment opportunity with Mercy. That doesn't count the students that have graduated. We, had, uh, we have 41 graduates in our program for the past two years that are EMTs, which are emergency medical technicians, and that's 11 hours of college that they get during the course of one year through Ignite. Um, and they're being hired by emergency rooms everywhere. So we've got seven working right here in Bentonville that have graduated. They'll hire them right after graduation and emergency rooms, we have them at Bentonville Fire Department, Pea Ridge Fire Department, um, Pafford Transport, Central Ambulance, they're, they're everywhere. Washington Regional, the health clinic on um, campus at U of A and so on. So I love the fact, I grew up in Bentonville, graduated from Bentonville High School and I love it that these people have partnered with us and now we can give back and these kiddos are working. But our little one in the middle, Jesus, is a great story. Jesus moved here from Mexico two years ago. And he had some humiliating experiences. He, he could not speak English. And the very first class that he went to at his high school here was an English class. The teacher did not know he couldn't speak and asked him to read. And he, it, it was horrible. They, um, then his family had a medical problem. He played, he played soccer. That was his connect. He learned great English on the soccer field. He, he made friends. He was good. They had injury. They went to Mercy. And, and, and really nobody's fault, but the, between the language barrier, they couldn't care they needed. So he went all the way back to Mexico for care. So fast forward one year. So he, he applied for Ignite. Unfortunately, he didn't even make it, the interview. Um, I wish, because <laughs> he's amazing. So he comes in this past year. He interviewed. He told us these stories, and it was just so hard to believe. He's such an overachiever. He is um, working at Mercy during his clinicals, a senior medical student who she's actually taking her impact now. He graduated residency. 
met him. She searched all over the district. She sent emails to medical instructors at the high schools, finally figured out that Jesus was in our program and said, I want to mentor him through college and med school. I was in his shoes at his age. And so she has taken a special interest in this kid and um, get him far. He was in his, so he's in the EMT program. So he's learning emergency medicine. He was in class, had a substitute teacher at West. In fact, I think she's coming over tomorrow so we can get some pictures. Um, and she has um, a, a, a bleeding disorder, I believe. And she's on blood thinner as well. She cut her leg on the file cabinet, which probably for any of us, it wouldn't be a big deal. But for her, it, she was bleeding. Um, he went to get the nurse on the way back. He said, probably we need to hurry. I went ahead and put a tourniquet on. And so Lori Darby, the nurse at West, and for a nurse to say this, she said it was a pool of blood. He really did save her at that point. So, and when I when we talked about it later, and we had stories of a student learned CPR, and the next day they were at their clinicals at Mercy and did CPR and saved someone. Literally saved a little lady. Um, last week, I had one of our CNAs that's working at Mercy recognize um, stroke symptoms, and the nurse was busy when they called, so she initiated the rapid response and got him in there and saved. These kids are learning, like, amazing skills. I, I would let any of them take care of me. But Jesus is going to go places. He will be a cardiologist someday, with no doubt about it. And and when he when those three presented, was it it was wow. impressive, wasn't it? It was amazing. <laughs> it is. They they speak way above me. These kids are so much smarter. My I won't go on and on. I could tell you so many stories. We have. I was saying earlier, we have students that they're first time graduates in their family, first time high school graduates, and then we're they're sitting beside students with perfect. But they all wear scrubs, so all those socioeconomic and, and demographic um, disparities just go out the door when they walk in because they have one. They all have a goal, and that's medical. And so my hope is that their certifications, and we have plenty. We've added EKG Tech next year or last year, and we had 100% pass. We have a little class of 11. We have 20 signed up this year. We have 38 um, future phlebotomy techs. They we've had 100% pass rate in that class for the past three years. So I've no you know, uh, no doubt they will. We just celebrated 24 CNA certified nurse assistants that just graduated, and we have another 12, 13 now taking the class. Um, and our EMT, we have 38. So it's just crazy how many are coming out of this program, and they're getting national certifications, which is which is awesome. And they're using them. But um, we, I tell them all, have a plan A. They all want to go to huge schools. We have one at Johns Hopkins right now. We have them applying to Harvard and Yale, and I hope they all do that, but we also know that life gets in the way. So if these tools and these certifications will give them a heads up when they're trying to get into their professional programs, that's awesome, but if it also gives them a tool that they can use to go work right away, because, you know, I had a little girl last year that she didn't plan to be pregnant. She had a full ride to college, and she ended up pregnant, and if she had not had her CNA, she would probably be working at a fast food restaurant. So that has kept her afloat until she can go to college. So anyway, um, thank you for supporting this program, and thank you for at least entertaining the idea of letting us expand. We'd love to be able to take so many more. Most of the students that interview are highly qualified, but we just can't take them all. So it'd be awesome to, to expand. So thank you. Uh, on the weighted credit, I'm just going to put my little two cents in. Put it in. Because <laughs> this is my one chance at the mic. Um, <laughs> I have several students that we would love to take in their junior year, and they interview, and they get excited, and then either their family makes a decision for them, or they decide they don't want to give up their rank. Because if they come into Ignite, and they take these, these classes are considered elective, and they're not weighted, it does affect that, that ranking because they are no longer on a five-point scale when they're taking these classes. So I think it would also actually, we'll have even more students trying to come into our program, which um, that's all, that's awesome. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, I don't think I can answer well, the question. <laughs> it's more with the health science, and if I understood what you were saying is, I guess is the traditional path for someone that's like, I want to go to medical school to take a bunch of AP classes. Is that And that's what probably medical schools are telling the parents and the, the students that this is what you do. If you want to be looked at for this school, you need to go take as many AP classes as possible. And, I think and if, that's what they're hearing, and I think that historically that has been the case. But we've got, I've got some very uh, sharp students right now, and they will tell you that if it weren't for Ignite, one of them's actually down at Baylor. Um, she's interviewing tomorrow, a live interview for their um, accelerated medical program, uh, where she would go in three years of undergraduate automatic acceptance to medical school. Um, she's also just had a live interview, or not a live, I don't think she, hers was live, 
the vir virtual interview for a full ride to University of Virginia, they will all tell you that Ignite, they really think that that's what gave them the sure. edge. That and their, you know, 36 ACT. So yeah, that helps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that definitely helps. But I think uh, as education is changing and you're trying to separate yourself, those that can come in and say, oh, yeah, I'm already certified and I've been working at a, a major, major health care hospital, that should separate them. But traditionally, we're hearing that you need as many AP classes. Because I've had a parent tell me, I was like, you should put them through the night program. They're like, that's not what we're hearing from CEOs of hospitals. It's take as many AP classes as possible. When they see this and they meet a child that goes through the Ignite, I think they probably would change their opinion a little bit. So, uh, is it, and, and so I guess you can do Ignite or AP, or there, do we have students that do both? Well, they're doing both. They're doing it's both. just that these are three, this is giving up three, um, three credit opportunities three credit. to do more. But I would say that most of my students are in AP classes as okay. well. Martin, great. And, and that's why we'll have the discussion. Weighted credit is currently for IB classes and AP classes, but there's a mechanism through the state where we can apply. And Jennifer's going to, Dr. Morris is going to go through that. We're asking to go through that process. And it's a big change, but to get weighted credit for our college concurrent credit classes, because we have to make a case how the content in those classes are as rigorous as AP classes. And so we'll talk about that because we don't want the challenge. We don't want kids to have to make that decision. I want the higher ranking, so I have to stay over here and not apply for Ignite. Yeah, and, wait, and I have one more um, student because I just thought about this one. <laughs> and then I'll quit. Uh, I have a student who worked really hard. She did not come into Ignite and took all college classes. She opted for the college college credit route versus the AP, and she did that for her sophomore and junior year, came into Ignite as a senior, and she would have been eligible for the nursing program this last January, but she wasn't 18. So she will start nursing school at NWAC in May. She'll be the youngest one ever to go through. So it, she likes to joke and say, yes, 19-year-old me coming at your service as an RN, but she'll be a 19-year-old RN. She's, she's been accepted, accepted into their accelerated nursing program, coming right out of high school. That's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but she opted for that route versus she'll have her associate's degree when she graduates. That's great. Yep. These are very valuable skill sets to have, high demand. And as you can see, $35 an hour, that's, that's a good wage for yeah. 17, that, thank 18, you, or 19 year old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, right. It's tempting. It's tempting to go be a CNA for that price, I guess. Um, so that's what we do. We get out and talk to the hospitals. And the, we were just had some meetings right before Christmas with clinics to say, what, what would, would it take? You know, you won't, you don't want to hire CNAs. Well, how can we get our students jobs in clinics? And they said, we need them to be medical assistants. So we went to work and Shannon has been working hard on a curriculum and, and we'll have our first um, group of students take their medical assistant certification in May. So we'll That's add great. another certification. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks. Okay, let's talk about what it's going to take. Okay. So uh, Spain. You can say with me if you want to, because I, I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to have you, um, Take them on a tour if you don't mind. So we'll go to move to the next slide. So um, currently we are employing 1.5 FTEs and we would like to add a 1.0 next school year and then another half. And then we talked about certification. A full time equivalent. It's just one teacher. And if it's 0.5, it's a half time teacher. That's a good question. Okay, sorry. That's all right. We and um, but anyway, we, we've got the certifications there, just for your reference again that she mentioned, and then the two additional certifications we believe that we're going we'd like to add uh, based upon being able to to make some facility changes. So we'll go ahead and move to the next one. So behavior techs and certified medical assistants. This is the cost of what it would look like for us. So a um, you can see the price or the cost of a one FTE and then a half FTE. We believe the equipment that we would need to buy to, to put it into a new place would be around 32000 And so here's the thought process behind that. Over here in these two areas, these two rooms are exactly the same, and there are creative arts area. Right now we do video production in that room. We do a graphic design program over here in this room. And we'd like to propose that we move um, the video production, but we're actually rebranding that, calling that digital media, and that'll include video and photography into this space, which is exactly the same space, just move, and then convert this to another training lab for health sciences in that area. That way they're close to their other facility. They can easily go out because we have an ambulance out there where they practice their EMT skills. And that would just be a, a nice space for them to use that. So we have talked and met with 
um, Mike Jackson about what that might look like. And I'd love it if you would mind taking a moment for us to take you into the CNA room, talk to you about what we're trying to duplicate in there and where we think that we might place that. Would you like to go on a little field trip? <laughs> we'll move around for a minute. And I'm going to let Wendy lead that because uh, she is definitely the one that they talked to and, and helped design that. Do I need to turn this off? Oh.
I appreciate you all taking such a, an interest in what we do every day. So for that area that we talked about uh, with the non-running water, the uh, Height Jackson sent us a, a quote of 74500 for that renovation. It says ignite remodels and expansion. These were all the options after Michelle walked through and worked with Flintco and looked at some of these. These are our options, and um, we're not recommending anything tonight. We're not taking any action, not moving ahead. But what after looking at the budget and speaking with Janet, um, our real recommendation would be option one for the medical room. Okay, and that's what mm -hmm. she spoke. She to. Uh, because remember how she sent something and then she updated. Sent, then she updated. They have the it. updated okay, form. So, okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Are we ready to We're move ready on? to move to the next one? All right. Like. Okay. The next one we'd like to look at is construction management, and many of you came out and toured that the other day and got to speak to Mr. Weeks. And I'm sorry, Mr. Weeks isn't here because he's just as passionate about his program as Wendy is about her program, and would love to to speak to you. So we're this is going to be condensed because now I'm in charge, <laughs> and so uh, uh, we will maybe have to take some of that passion out. But this program has been in existence since 2016 as well. So it started the same year that Wendy's program started. However, when we first started, we were at West. That was where our classroom space was. We didn't have a, a space. And we could only do a half-day program because we shared that uh, space with Ag. So for a couple of years, we were there. Then we were fortunate enough to, to move over to the ALE building because the bike program moved out, moved over to the high school, and it left some open space. And then we could grow our program so that he could have a morning and an afternoon session. So he was housed there for a couple of years. And then uh, Dr. Jones said, I think I found us a space that could be maybe a, a little bit longer term. And now we're in the space he's in now, which is by Washington Junior High and was the old building bridges. Yes, I as I recall. So he's there. They've been doing some renovations on it because when they moved in, it had little sinks, little toilets. You know, it was made for little people. And um, uh, they've done, they're, they're, they're working slowly on that because they do other projects for other people all the time. So they're coordinating multiple projects at a time. So we really begin to take a look at that construction area and what could we do with uh, growing those programs and really helping students find a place in a future, something where they're undecided and we understand that we, we, we need to put some, give them some skills. So really over the past five years, we've gone to all kinds of workforce council meetings and summits and there, um, we worked with the Northwest Arkansas Council so we've been talking this language for quite some time, but now we've become a little more serious. We've grown that construction management program till it's full, and we'd like now to expand that a bit. But, you know, do we just continue to do exactly the same thing we're doing now with construction management and really pushing for numbers? Or do we look at something else maybe in the arena that is a different certification, but yet kind of falls, they could all fall together? So we really reached out to Northwest Arkansas Council, talked to them about what the high needs, high skill areas were. And it's really in that industrial maintenance area. So it's, again, it's a hands-on, it's a certification that students can go right into the workforce, but yet leads to those college courses all the way up to engineering. So it's that great career path that we're looking for. Prepare them to, to walk out with a certification and go to work, but yet put them on that trajectory for college. And what is it that they may want to do? We want to hit all students, every student, every student, one that does not plan to go to college to one that I want that four-year degree and I plan to manage the places. So we we want to hit them all. So we talked to Northwest Arkansas Council preparing for this meeting, and they sent me something that says, industrial maintenance continues to be our higher employment need in the region, and its postings cover many areas, including electrical, motor control, hydraulics, pneumatics, installation, assembly, and maintenance operations. The latest report indicates that more than 3,300 positions were posted last year alone. So it is in high demand and we hear it at every workforce meeting that we go to. Now that, that is something that we are desperately in need of. 
So we looked at that. Okay, well, how can we help that pipeline? What can we be doing for our Walmarts and our Tysons and our Beckharts and, and these groups that are there that are desperate for these workers? And so we went and Dr. Jones went with us as well to look at multiple programs. So we went to look at industry training just in a, in a uh, small area where they're training and upskilling people. And then we went to multi-million dollar facilities and looked at their industrial maintenance programs. And um, we really settled on what would what would fit the needs for us. And we feel like what would fit the needs for us is to bring in some equipment trainers that do this training. Uh, I think maybe on the next page. No, that's where Mr. Weeks was going to come in and speak on students. So we'll go ahead and go to the next page. Um, but this is the, what the equipment trainers look like. So you can see they really don't take up much space if we keep it small. Now, when you go to these multi-million dollar ones, there's huge machinery in there. And they're, they're probably, I think when we visited Don Tyson, they said they were doing 86 different skill sets in there. Well, that took a lot of machinery. But to get a student ready for employment, we can do it with these trainers. And um, so this is a this is a company called Amatrol. We looked at them. We looked at other ones too, but they're going to have a turnkey. It's ready. It's set. It, it does the training. It has the curriculum that goes with it. It's multimedia, so it's active and engaged. Where a student will look at it, then they get on there and they practice it, and then they pass their uh, certification test. Now, Mr. Weeks was supposed to speak to this, and he could have given you a lot more details because uh, this is his language and his world. So I, I, I apologize for that. Um, but he is on live stream, and so he can't answer questions if you have them. But I did bring material that, that's back in the room. If this is something like I'm very interested in all of that, I'd like to know more about what you would train students in. I've brought some pamphlets back there that, that you could look at. But we believe that starting this program, we could blend it in with the construction and uh, then grow from there. Now, we would bring these trainers in and we might have to rearrange some of the construction and some of the area, but we believe it's important that let's start um, by blending before we actually build on, but look at building on, because that is the long term that we, we would need more space. We're, we, we're, we would be kind of, I don't want to use the word cramming because it's not cramming, but we'd have to rearrange some things that may not be as ideal as it is right now for the construction area. But um, we think that, let's go ahead and see. Let's go to that next slide. So in here right now, you can see that we have one FTE. It's Mr. FTE, and that's Mr. Weeks. So we're proposing we'd love to see one more FTE. We'd love to see 40 more students at least involved in the program. Can't promise that because we're in the middle of recruiting right now, what that looks like. Um, but I do know that students in these programs, you have to actively get out and talk to them. <laughs> Uh, they don't, they're not a medical student that's had their plan since they were in fifth grade. They, a lot of them don't have the plan. They, they hear about things, but they really don't, they don't really seek out how to achieve that. So it is very intentional recruiting on our part. And then for counselors to, to look at a student that doesn't have a plan and say, I know where, let, let's try this. Let's just try this. Uh, you get with Mr. Weeks. And a teacher like Mr. Weeks, they're going to work with you and they're going to make you love something and they're going to make you see the benefit and the value in it. And I think most of you that have met him understand that passion and how he has a way of, of doing those things. So it is a strong recruiting effort, but a strong counseling effort that those two things work together. We believe we have those students. Right now, we do a, a survey in the high schools. It's called Leave Hire. And it's looking, and one of the data that they look at are um, what students are interested in after high school. And um, there was at least 70 that put something in one of these areas, construction or industrial. But there was another 50 that had no idea. They put, I don't know, left it blank, question mark, I don't have any idea, you know, because they can put whatever words they want in there. So there was all of those things. Those are the ones we've got to go find. Got to go find, we've got to make a plan. And um, so that's what we Ignite will be doing. We will definitely have flex sessions with them, meet with them, and try, and then have hopefully have the counselors counseling with them and, and working on getting them in these programs. So that is um, what we 
propose and think that would be a really great idea as an expansion to construction is adding this whole industrial side to that. Okay, so let's take a look. speak to the construction end of that? Are you getting ready to go there? Uh, I am the on the next page, itself? the cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right now, what we would like to, to um, ask for is another FTE where we hope to fill those 40 spots. If it's a half, and then it turns to one the next year. So, you know, that's great too. Um, but we think we have the partners in place, ready to roll with all of that. And then equipment costs are high. This Amatrol system, that's the basic system that gets someone started, is 240000 And so, um, and it comes with, though, the training software. But we think it's the best investment for what we really want to get accomplished and to, to have them prepared and ready. And then the construction costs. So what they've been looking at, so Height Jackson, Flint Co., I think it, no, actually, I think it was Crossland came out and took a look at the space where Chris is now. So you guys are familiar with that space because many of you toured that. And well, while you were on that tour, he mentioned an area towards the back of the building that was just wide open. It used to be a playground, and now they're using it, and they, they store lumber out there, and they do some welding out there. And um, But you could add on to that space. It adds uh, quite a bit of square footage and add another lab there of sorts. So they looked at that and um, to try to see what the costs were. They actually came up with four plans because, you know, they like to dream big. <laughs> yeah, they were like, we can build that. We can take this and just add something in the back. We can take it. We can add something upstairs to add you more classroom space and gives you some opportunities to expand and, you know, just kept kind of getting bigger. But really the needs are um, to add some lab space in the back to, to put the industrial maintenance piece in. That's our highest need at this point. And Dr. Jones alluded to that, like, what's the long-term goal and what's something now? I can um, tell you, board you want members, to say something. You have schematics in your folder. If you look there and they are marked, the first one is the existing building. And then you see option one. The option one is the extension, um, one floor at the back. It's described in your one sheeter, but that's 1.5 million. That would be our recommendation for the money to invest in that building. Um, and then there's option two. Four million adds a second floor, if you can look at option two. Option three is 4.6 million. It has a second floor, but it also adds space for aviation, which is the next program we'll discuss. And then option four is demolish and rebuild out there which is uh, 7.3 or 9.8. There were two, two choices on that. We've shared all of those with you, but really our recommendation, if we decide to, to put money into that building would be option one. Thank right, you. Teresa. Okay, and of course we can't see that, but um, at least you can see drawings of that. And I appreciate them spending so much time on helping us think through those things. Is it okay if we move on? Or does anyone have questions for Chris yet or you want to wait? Because, I mean, I might be able to answer some of them, but it depends on how technical they are. Okay. Maybe you'll think some. If, uh, we'll take questions at the end for sure. Um, let, we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. So this is something that uh, we would like to propose to add. And over the last five years, the aviation community has been visiting with Dr. Jones about adding aviation, and they've come specifically come and said to add it to Ignite. And she's just not been there, been ready. We're not, we haven't been there, been ready. But over the last couple of years, we've started to add pieces of that into our strands. So two years ago, we started um, adding a certification for a part 107 drone pilot. And it affects all of our strands. So students that are in emergency medicine, they, they use drones for search and rescue. So some students were really interested in taking a drone certification. Obviously photography, cinematography, that's used a lot. Technology, they're interested in anything that they can put their hands on and program and touch and do all that. But there's also, they've also added an aviation flight simulator in their room because there's that interest in aviation. Whenever we talk about global business, this, there's a whole last mile concept and how we're going to start doing deliveries now. So that's a huge piece. And um, so it's in construction, 
I mean, they're, they're doing with all of the roofing and everything in construction, even agriculture with our culinary students. We have culinary students that take drone certification. They all have a different interest and a why behind why they've taken that. So we've actually gone through that program and I'm going to introduce Dr. Ham here in just a second. Um, but he's been our instructor that we had come in and teach that course. And we have now 25 uh, licensed Part 107 drone pilots. So we're very, very happy and proud. It was actually Dr. Ham's first time to spend a lot of time with high school students doing something like that. This is something he does at the U of A, not necessarily at high school. So it's been a little bit different. Um, we also have an aviation club that is at both high schools, and they have about 50 very active members. It's not your typical school club. Uh, one of the reasons I feel like it's ran, one of the sponsors, there's three of them, but one of them is Jessica Immel, and she's our global business teacher. And if you've ever met her, anything she touches, she does. It's phenomenal. She's going to give 110%. So those students have had so many opportunities. They've, def they've gone on tours of game composites and some in aviation, XNA. And then she serves on a foundation called Tailwinds Foundation. So she's the education liaison for that aviation community. And now she's got students plugged in where they're earning scholarships so that they can get their private pilot license. And she's got them connected with flight instructors. So it's a very active group. So there's a very a strong interest in, in, our, um, in our school district. So I'm going to give you some more little numbers. 208,000 new pilots and 192,000. Or 92, new technicians will be needed in North America by 2039, according to the 2020 Boeing Pilot and Technician Outlook. In 2018, the FAA forecasted a need for 350,000 remote pilots, remote pilots by 2023. Space tourism, urban air mobility, electronic electric aircraft, and other emerging technologies are taking off in the FFA Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force has formed to encourage high school students to pursue high demand careers in aviation. Airlines, business aviation, aircraft manufacturing, and unmanned aerial delivery services are all growing a presence in Northwest Arkansas. So that's the, the national demand. But we know that there's starting to be a strong demand in Northwest Arkansas. So I brought an expert in to talk to you a little bit about why, why now? Why should we consider doing this now? Dr. Richard Hamm um, is at the University of Arkansas in the College of Engineering. And um, that is predominantly what he does is he serves on several boards and he is in charge of that unmanned aerial system there. So Dr. Hamm. Welcome. Uh, this is our board. I'm so excited for them to meet you. And uh, he's just been instrumental in uh, advising us on all of our drone purchases. Um, I, I could, I don't know what drones to, to get and what, what those are. Um, so he's really spent uh, and has invested a great deal of time uh, to help us make sure that we made all the right moves. Well, thank you. And I'll just First off, I'll be transparent and tell you that I do have an interest in what happens here. I have four granddaughters that are coming through the school uh, district here, so very interested in the opportunities that were there. I'll, I'll start by uh, uh, giving you a couple of a pitch, I guess I would say, about why it's important. And I'm going to give you project you some project some things for you about what's happening here regionally. Most people probably would be surprised to know if you ask most people. What's the number one export for Arkansas? They'd probably say rice. It's aerospace, and it's not even close. 19.7, almost 20% of the export value that leaves the state is aerospace. Now, a lot of that is focused in Little Rock and some other areas now, but it's moving here, and it's moving here rapidly. I just had a meeting today on a need for training for a, a group here says, hey, we need mechanics to do this, and we're going to have to bring them in from outside because we can't build them here. Right now, uh, there's easily, easily, in three to five years, going to be a shortage in these types of jobs. I'm not just talking pilots of 3,000 jobs, at least. And I'm talking about in this region. It's likely going to be more, and we're going to see it grow depending on some of the activity that comes. So let me talk a little bit about 
what the opportunity is and how we can prepare students that would come out at every step. So some will decide that they might want to be a mechanic a and We already know there's a shortage uh, of a and literally hundreds of thousands that we know will be short in 15 years uh, nationally. And here there's going to be a shortage. And then that's going to increase because of some of the things that are happening here in, in this region. Pilots, there's a shortage, and it's probably going to get worse. It's looking, I could go into all the reasons and studies that we've done and others, but it's going to increase. Remote pilots, just right here, they're ready to, to hire. So we've taken, uh, students have been to Zipline, they've been to Drone Up. Drone Up's going to expand. And if you haven't had a chance to go out there, I know some have, you should see that. And you, you would see immediately what an amazing engineering feat it is. And it takes operators, engineers, uh, maintainers, all of those things that fit into that. It's a pretty complex system, including programmers. A lot of what we do now at the university is we have to teach, hey, here's the drone. You want it to do this. You can't buy it off the shelf. I need you to write a program for it. And please don't crash it. It costs a lot of money. But more than the traditional uh, pieces, we also are seeing an advanced air mobility that feeds into this. Electronic vertical and takeoff and, and landing. The airport board here, I'm on the airport board. We just put in an electric charging, an aircraft electric charging station. And there are some in the country, but not an airport this size. And so we're going to see those start to come here. And that means we need support for those. That means we need engineers that can do that kind of work. And we need people that work with composites and understand things. From technician to PhD students, every level. And some that will come through, we know they're going to, they're going to choose how I'm going to start out and I'm going to work my way through as a mechanic. But then... I'm going to use that to pay to get my bachelor's degree, and then I want to be an engineer, or I want to do something in operations. If I was if, if I was to talk about the different uh, disciplines that are affected right now, especially in advanced air mobility, it's everything you can think of. I think when Ms. Hudson, when Teresa was talking about when we did the drone course, we had all strands. You use a thermal drone, there's already been, in several use cases uh, overseas, early days of COVID, they were screening individuals with the thermal if they had the right kind of sensor to see who, had, who in a crowd had a temperature. And then they were going and weeding people out. Um, in the construction strand, we actually, they didn't just get their certification last year, but they also learned how to do what's called a real-time kinetic or a RTK survey level accuracy for a, for construction sites. So it'd be, it would be accepted the same as if you had a surveyor come and do that work. They learned how to do the setup. They learned how to do all of the things associated with that and actually did this. Um, one of the students now is doing an internship at the sheriff's department, and uh, he's out helping them with search and rescue. Actually, in his internship, using the drone for that, and then we've got others that are interested in doing inspection. So I can tell you students from the university and others where they're just, uh, just scratching the surface of what they're doing. Ozark Electric is hiring right now for individuals to be drone operators because they're going to shift from using light aircraft to drones to do all of the inspections on their lines, which is a lot safer. If you think about just doing the inspections, for instance, the antenna farm south of Fayetteville where you've got an 800 foot tower. You've seen some of those in the distance. Um, but the drone, now you can inspect that because we have a, a good enough sensor that has the, the resolution. We can look and see if there's a problem, a structural problem, instead of somebody having to climb that. I never, I wouldn't want to have been that person to start with. But, and, and, but it saves money and it's also safer. So the things that you think of, there will be demonstrations within this year um, that anybody would be able to see of Joby aircraft, which is basically will be an airborne Uber. They're flying now. This is not Jetsons in the future. They're flying them. They're tested. They've already gone through aircraft certification. They will be here. 
there's no doubt in one to two years they'll be here. Uh, there's one we did at the, that uh, company we worked with at the, the, the Northwest Arkansas Tech Summit. They're already going through their final certification for a cargo drone carries 500 pounds. And they'll be looking for airspace design to do routes back and forth. So you know you can let your imagination here, but as an example, you know if you wanted to get something back and forth to Jonesboro, Arkansas, there's just no good way to get there. But you can do that with some of these that have more than 300 nautical mile ranges, and you can have you can start seeing what's going to happen, and that's already in the works. So I say that a few years ago, I was I was kind of being the evangelist, telling even our own folks, our our, our professors when we're doing research, it's coming, it's coming. And now I'm saying it's here. It's not coming. It is here. It's already in other parts of the country. We already have drone delivery here. That's going to be the first step of this. And all of these career fields that we're talking about are going to grow drastically. So the opportunities, um, and people don't even think about what else would you do. So I'll give you as an example uh, myself, my wife says I hadn't figured out what I want to do when I grow up. But I've been an air traffic controller, uh, a pilot, uh, aviation and transportation security and enforcement agent. I mean, you go up, so you just kind of look at all these different things that I've done and now doing research. All of that, you know, is would be what you would get out of aviation stream. So, um, I probably talk too long, but if you talk airplanes, I can do it a very long time. I mean, I like to talk airplanes, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if we're to that point about how you, how you want to do it, about what kind of things it would mean and, and where you could go with it. Dr. Ham, first, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. I can certainly see your passion. Uh, it seems that this strand, uh, maybe back to when I was coming, the kind of programming, right? That was early on. Like, what is that? Oh, that's computers. I don't need to. I don't need to think <laughs> about that. I'm going to go get a general business degree. And so, the, what? What? Maybe at the college level, you're seeing it more here locally, though. What are the opportunities for students? Well, there's certainly going to be with supply chain. It's a combination of both last mile and then also further. So I wouldn't even say. So like drone up, I would call them last mile. You've seen them there in Farmington now. They'll be here. And within a few months, they'll be in Bentonville. So they're working their way as they go through certifications with the FAA. Zipline's not last mile. They have a 50 nautical mile. And so when you think in aviation terms, everybody goes, oh, 50. Well, that's all of Joplin, almost uh, a good portion, or at least a western portion of uh, Springfield, almost to Fort Smith. And they're going through a certification for an extension of that to where they'll be doing deliveries from there. So from Pea Ridge, you could see deliveries going in that whole area. So there's going to be those, and, and every one of those is going to require a new model. There'll be a new model of how do supply chains work, how do, what's the decision models, when do we decide to put it on the truck. Um, you know, the whole Amazon, I, you know, I tell my grandkids, sometimes they look at me and they, they'll say, Papa, we don't want to hear that. It's a long time. But, Joe, you know, when you used to order something and say, well, now four to six weeks to delivery, they can't even imagine anything like that. So now we're talking hours to deliver or one hour to delivery and all those miles have to be built. The technicians that have to uh, do the testing over time to figure out what are the failure rates for drones, different types of uh, EV toll aircraft, they, all that that's built for normal aviation now, that's not there. It's, we're learning that. So all of that plus the maintenance plus all of the things, anything that you can think of that attaches to, you know, even the charging station. You know, we have a company that the city uh, contracted, but the time's coming where it's setting those stations up and even going out uh, to do surveys to figure out, can we do deliveries here? Every piece of that has a support. So Zipline, as an example, one of the things that they have to do is they have to go out with a drone in advance that has a laser, a, a LIDAR sensor on it, go out and build these very precise elevation models so they know exactly how far. Because satellite only gives you about 20 meter accuracy and you need to get sub-meter accuracy so that you make sure you're not running into trees. So all of that has to be built. So if you could imagine mapping the whole region 
eventually so that we have these really accurate maps that can be used for that. Um, every, everything that I could think of, the models for air traffic control, there's, there's going to be new civil engineering standards because for, for the EV tolls, there's a, a brand new concept instead of heliports called vertiports. And so everything with those, these, you know, the protected airspace that you build, all that has to be built from scratch. So I could go on and on. There's literally anything that you could think of. It'll be in the construction world, there, it's going to be a game changer. There's no doubt about it. It's going to dramatically change how surveys are done and how we look at uh, inspections. Inspections are just a no-brainer. I have a student uh, that uh, from not here in the high school, but uh, in an exec ed program we did, that finished, the, and then the next week he bought a thermal drone. And all he does now is go out and people will, one of the uh, energy audit companies will pay him to do roof audits to see where people are losing heat. Takes him about 10 minutes for each one. He charges $250 a piece. People are happy to pay it. So, so there's, there's what I'm telling you is in my mind, but then the, the entrepreneurial spirit in this region, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you, because every time I think that I've seen every use, you know, I'll give you quickly another one. One of my students um, took that uh, using drone and the modeling that we taught them to do, and they go, he, all that he does now is after there's an automobile accident, he goes, builds a three-dimensional model of that whole area, and then builds a simulation for the accidents and attorneys are paying him five to ten thousand dollars for each model that he builds that they can take into court as a visual model so like i said every time i think that i know what all the use cases are somebody comes up with an idea and starts making money from it now, it's not just about that but I, I, i'll tell you and, and probably of the students that we had here the most excited and i had a great time was uh, I got to take two of the students to do the drone footage that we did for the uh, Texas game. It was a great game. And we got to see it from the best, I mean, literally from the scoreboard, from the drone, the whole thing, which is pretty rare. You have to go through a, you know, a pretty rigorous TFR to, to get that approval to do it. So they got the opportunity to do that and just kind of see what, you know, I guess you would say, uh, what's kind of the high end of the, the things that you would do and, and be able to do. And they did a great job. Did a great job. So. Thank you for that, board. Is there any questions for Dr. Ham? So what does the instruction look like? I mean, I mean I'm a drone owner, so I, I'm, it's all cool to me. But sure. uh, how do you, what, like, where do you start with a student and how's a program like start from day one and where does it end at the end of the semester or the end of the year? So it, it, it takes us 12 to 15 weeks. Uh, because of weather and some other things uh, starting on this year, we've got two that are testing now, two or three that are still took it after. And we had, in fact, I had a review session today for some of them before they went to take their FA exam. Um, we have a structured exam that we use. It's an e-cook kit we go through and we do, then I do lectures associated with that. Um, for the 107 certificate, that's about 40% of a private pilot written. You know, what is a 107? I'm sorry. So remote pilot. So that, uh, I should have explained that up front. So in the in the law, the Code of Federal Regulations, the slang is about which part of the code. In this case, it's Part 107 in the Federal Administrative Code. So that's where the authority to issue a remote pilot certificate. And when I say they issue it. They have a, it's a pilot certificate. You know, it, it has a different, but it's, the FAA designates them as a pilot. They're considered an, an airman, that definition, and it's permanent. That's, they have that for their life. Unless they do something silly and it gets revoked, they'll have it forever. But I don't think any of these students are. They're, the students here have been very, very uh, conscientious in making sure that they didn't, I have more problem with graduate students than I do with high schools figuring they can get away with doing something so anyway we go but but we also set this on that one purposely to where we didn't just do that i mean because you know the excitement for when a student shows up 
they see, hey, I want to learn how to fly a drone. And if all they get for 12 weeks is, oh, I'm going to get a lecture and we're going to do this for two hours. So it, nearly every class, if the weather allowed us, then we flew a different drone. And so uh, each of the drones that um, the district invested in had everything from small, learn it, and then if you crash it, it's not the end of the world to, you know, $4,000 worth. If you crash it, we're not happy. But, but and then the RTK models where you have to learn how to sync the, the uh, to do the high-end surveying, we have to sync a satellite, a satellite sync, uh, and, you know, make sure that you've got the best, you know, the, the, basically the best product that you can. So we'd go out, let them fly every week, and we start, you start baby steps, and we have some, you know, some of them, they've already had their drone, and they're like it's a race car. And some of them are scared to death to even touch it. And by the time we get to the end, they're comfortable with doing it. So they get several opportunities. And then we'll end up with a project. So they'll build, uh, they'll use, learn how to use the software to build a three-dimensional model or a thermal model. We did a thermal model uh, of this building this, you know, to, to, for them to get practice to see, hey, is, are, are you losing heat and air out of there? And then we built some, several 3D models. Last year, we built a 3D model at Crystal Bridges, where we gave to Crystal Bridges at the end, which they appreciated and, and actually have used. So. What, is it? what is the 3D model? What You just go and run a drone over all their campus mm -hmm. and then give them a digital 3D model? <laughs> that's right. It's a, it's a digital 3D model that's done. This was by photogrammetry. We didn't use a LIDAR, but a photo, which just means photos at different angles. And then use the software to generate it, and then it's it's a three D model that you can run through. So we did that on the outside. They do. It's a, it, and the, and it's a that's a good point. So you know everybody thinks of firefighters. You can use the thermal to look and uh, see. Hey, there's someone there I'm looking for. Search and rescue kind of things, but also in a building to see is there a person that's trapped in there or something else. But in advance, uh, several cities will begin to build 3D models for everything from how you deal with an active shooter to understanding what's really going on with that facility before they get there. So, and that's just part of, that's just part of what you, you would uh, be able to produce with. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I have a, a question. Um, I'm kind of like, it, this feels like we're, um, in the days of when the computer filled up a whole room, you know, kind of a thing. I mean, that's what it feels like we're about to step into this next phase of how we operate. Um, but I guess my question is, it, you know, you talk about like the the levels of what's, you know, the cutting edge is whatever we have today that's cutting edge is going to be old news tomorrow. Is this something that we feel, I mean, for one, do you feel like this is going to be like whatever they're learning? Is it going to be kind of sustainable? You know, is, you know, certifications they're getting today, is that going to be relevant in five years? Or is, is whatever certification they're getting going to be replaced by some other thing? And then, you know, as a school district, are we going to be able to keep up with the equipment that's going to be necessary to keep them cutting edge in there without breaking the bank? Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, the certification, uh, there's good news and bad news to answer that one. The, you know, the good news is that the certification will last forever. Uh, there, there's skill upgrades that you would do. You'd uh, upskill, obviously, as equipment does. But, you know, the bad news is the reason is because the FAA moves slow, 20, 30, 40 years slow. They're way behind on this. So, uh, it, but it's a good point. But, but, but that certification would carry that it, for the rest of their life into a place like Zipline or Drone Up, where they'd say, hey, I have a remote pilot certificate. I'd like to apply here and get trained on your system. And that would be, that would be their ticket in. Um, most, if you, if you think of the air carriers as an example, the way that it would work is that you, you come in, you have your pilot certificate, but when you go to the carrier that hires you, they're going to get you rated on their airframe. So they might fly Airbus instead of Boeing, and so they pay for the next one, but you got to have the entry level to get there. Um, the, 
the question about technology is a really good question because here's to, to give you an example. But but we purposely, when I gave some recommendations, purposely planned the aircraft that the the drones that were purchased, all of which were going to be in standards that you could change things. For instance, the Inspire Two, which is that's the one that all the kids, it's like the sports car version. It goes really fast. You got to tell them to slow down. And it, it, uh, the, you know, the, the gear comes up and, it, and it's, it's one of the best. It's actually used in Hollywood for some smaller productions when they do those types of work. That has a shoe and a replaceable sensor. So you can upgrade the sensors. Um, the money, the money in technology for drones is not in the drone. It's all in the sensors. We have a drone, the, the last big one that we bought at the university, the drone was about 25,000, the sensor was 160,000. So we have a 200,000 drone, 160,000 of it is in the sensor. But we've specifically picked some of those, the picked platforms that were replaceable. So uh, on that one as an example, you can replace, there's two of the others where you can upgrade just the sensor. It is a good thing to consider because down the road on the drone, drone piece, you have to consider what's going to change. But last year, one of the updates that uh, is, you know, nothing's current six months from now in this. It's kind of like calculators. But... They have a Skydio, one of the, an S2, which for obstacle avoidance has an artificial intelligence engine in it, the most advanced, and it looks like a toy. You look at it and say, did you get that at Walmart in the toy aisle? But it will literally fly autonomously. We could fly it through this building. We could program it to fly in between. I've taken it up to my cabins in the mountains, and it would follow me, and then when it couldn't catch me, it would go up, wait till it saw me again, and come back and follow me. And they learned how to use those systems. So I think they're pretty safe uh, for foreseeable future for us. And the skill sets, uh, I'll say, we talked a lot about the drones, but not about some, some future pieces if someone wanted to be a pilot or do more. The skill sets of understanding airspace and weather, um, all of them walk in the first day and they think it's impossible they'll ever understand the weather decoding because aviation has its own language and they put everything and you can't really understand uh, how that is. But they have to learn things like what different types of fronts mean, what it, you know, whenever you get hail, how come it's hail instead of snow and how come it's snow pellets like yesterday instead. And so they have to learn all those meteorological things. Those skill sets will stick with them no, no matter what. They'll have those from, from now on. Teresa, how many students are we thinking about opening this up to at the beginning. And do we have the physical space for that? That's exciting news. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was waiting for him to talk about the Jetson uh the, did he say Jetson? You said Jetson. Everybody caught that. Okay. And that, and then, and I was waiting for him to talk about the 16 year olds that can drive them that don't have to have a license and the scary yeah. stuff. And There, there, there's so much happening in in that world, and and what's that other company that's coming? A canoe, or is that Mm -hmm. It's all coming here. I'm going to quiz you on the new aviation versus the old one. I'm not 
<laughs> well, we learned that stick doesn't just mean get stuck in the phlebotomy room because someone did that the other day. They're good at sticks or something. I don't know. And I was like, I was looking at my feet. Okay, let's talk about this. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. And so, um, so this is what we're we're looking at right now is that we would just add a, a half time and start small because this is a really new area and that's how we've done everything. Get into a new area. We like to start small. We like to build those partnerships. We like to look at those certifications. We like to reflect, revise and all that before we start bringing on another student. So that's what we're proposing. Um, we, I, I told you that we've been working with this aviation community for a long time. And so um, we finally went back and said, okay, we might be thinking about something like this. So out at Thaden Field, which, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but there's like, there's the restaurant there to eat and there's Thaden Field and then there's Summit Aviation and then there's the backcountry piece. And it's just like all these things going on over there. But Summit Aviation predominantly oversees all those facilities out there. So it's Thaden Field, but they oversee the facilities. And so they've offered a space so that we can start our classes in a building they call it FOB fixed operations base FBO FBO I gotta learn I'm learning so fixed base operations it was their former building till they built their new building that they're in now and um, it's about 1500 square feet and they plan to put a doctor in there uh, eventually but they said this is just available space we want you guys to get started we're willing to partner with you on that and provide you a flight instructor. So we would have our own instructor. We always want our own instructor. It doesn't work well if we don't have a Bentonville employee overseeing everything that's happening. But um, but as far as when we get to that point that we might need a flight instructor, not everyone in this program is going to be a pilot. I think everyone has kind of a love of flying and maybe a dream of doing that, but maybe not everyone. We went in, uh, to a meeting yesterday that um, was a community of people all across the state talking about aviation. And we got introduced to students that were in an aviation program at Harbor. And it was a long list of things that they were interested in. It was not all about being a pilot, but it's definitely looking towards the military, um, definitely working in the, that A&P area where it's um, working with the mechanics. So um, there's lots of interest in that. Some people, you know, they want to be astronauts. I mean, it's, the, the dreams are big, and, and we want to build dreams. We, we want to help those students achieve those things. The curriculum, we've been looking at curriculum. What would that look like? So uh, one that we would want to adopt that's being used is called AOPA, and that's put out by Air Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, so it's a STEM curriculum, and uh, it can start as early as ninth grade. So if this program is something that we end up going and putting in lower grades and building up, um, then it's available as um, young as a ninth grade curriculum. It also is got those stackable credentials where they earn their part 107, that un unmanned aerial systems, as well as the knowledge test of the pilot's license. So that all comes with it. And we believe what our goal is, is for our students to earn their 107 that first semester. And then that second semester start to really dive into different areas of interest. So where it might be pilot's license, but it may be more mechanics. Summit said, we've got the people for you. We've got people, you know, they have their own mechanics out there. They build their own planes out there. Um, we've got these opportunities to come in. We've got the speakers and experts in every field that we will bring to you. And um, we'll provide um, all that support and those internships as well. But we know we can go to XNA. We have other places, Zipline other partners doesn't need to just be summit aviation but whatever they can do they said we're here we're willing to help we, we want to get this thing started so um we think you know now may be the time if you feel like that's what we should do um we'll go ahead and go to the next slide and so we are just looking at uh, a half fte for next semester to get or next year to get started but we would certainly hope that it would grow to full time and then uh, equipment costs we just did an estimate of um, possibly some uh, simulators that they have but summit's already said hey we think we might be able to get those for you too so i still put that in here because they didn't commit to that but they think that they want to help us in that area and then if there's some drones and maintenance we put an estimated 125,000 on that 
And then construction costs, we really right now don't have any because we're not planning to put that in necessarily at that other building, even though we had talked about it, what would our future look like? But I think we have a lot of alternatives uh, to what our future could look like. So we're, we're hoping they like us being there um, because uh, we would love for our students to be there much like they are at the culinary building. And they're just mixed in with all of those professionals. There's just nothing better than being there. And this is sort of the same thing. When you walk out of their classroom, there's like five airplanes just sitting there um, that, you know, don't have their own hangar, apparently. I'm learning all this, too. You know, some people get hangers, some people don't. They're kind of like outside parking and inside parking. So uh, they're sitting out there. And um, I just think that's phenomenal and exciting and it's inspiring. And um, they're going to be around all of these people that have a passion for it, too. So I think that might conclude everything that I was presenting tonight. Um, I'm, we, I'm, I bet we've, well, thank you. <laughs> yes. And I'm so sorry for Chris. He was looking so forward. He's never been sick and, and not ever. And I know he wants to be here. Yes. He's sad, so hi, Chris. They all met Chris yes. at the building. <laughs> they so did. They're familiar. Uh -huh. But this leads into our next discussion about weighted credit. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. If you have any questions, let me know. And it is a big decision for the district to look at weighted credit for college credit because I asked all our partner districts and it's not frequently done for anything except AP and IB. And, uh, but it, I think, it, and when I was at the department, I wasn't a big fan of offering weighted credit for anything other than AP and IB. Um, but once I see the work that they're doing, in some of these CTE fields, um, I know it's just as rigorous as the AP work. So Jennifer, take it away. Hi, members of the board, Dr. Jones. Um, I'm glad to share a little bit here with you this evening. I have less than um, 10 slides and I'm gonna race through the first five and um, then tell some stories with about three of the slides. And I uh, will get to that course catalog in just a minute. There are just two pages there where it will help us with some of the examples and the stories in the end. So th this is just for information only. We don't have a recommendation for you, um, and it would take a, a policy later for this option. What we want you to know is that the Division of Elementary and Secondary Education has a set of rules. They've got lots of rules. Um, this set is um, the rules governing grading and course credit. The most recent version of that is from June 2020. And one of the things in that set of rules is that it provides an option for school boards to adopt a policy to allow high school students to take college courses for weighted credit. So I'm just going to give you a little overview of this um, set of rules. So this is what the table of contents looks like at the beginning of that set of the rules. You can see it starts with their authority to do this and definitions, and they give us a uniform grading. Um, scale in the state, and then they talk about um, high school course credit and weighted credit and concurrent credit. So we'll go on to the next slide. And um, this is the same set of rules, just to get you a little familiar. This is the same set of rules that gives us that uniform grading scale for the whole state of Arkansas. Not all states do this. In some states, two neighboring districts may have two very different grading scales because one district may say that an A is 90 to 100. And another district might say that an A is 92 to 100. Um, but here in this state, the several gives us that. And it also says that that A is going to be worth four points when we start figuring a GPA. This is also, we love this part. Um, this is the set of rules that says a grade should reflect knowledge and skills demonstrated by the student and not whether or not you brought in a box of tissues and not whether or not you got your parent to get a parent-teacher conference night. Um, if you've ever encountered those things as a student or a parent, um, this is the set of rules that says knowledge and skills that it's standards based. Um, your grade should be based on your knowledge of the standards. And um, this is the same set of rules that says that elementary schools can follow this secondary uniform grading scale, or elementary schools have the options to have standards based grading, which our district has done for many years. So, this on the next slide um, is where we get into the weighted credit. So this is the set of rules, and this is also not as unique to the state. Not every state does this, and this could vary from district to district some places. 
But here in this state, our state has already said that every advanced placement and in IB, International Baccalaureate course, in a high school in this state is going to get weighted credit at that five point. So that means a B in an AP or an IB course is worth as much as an A in a course that isn't weighted. So you can take the risk and make a B and be okay. And, and that, that encourages students to take risks and to challenge themselves. And there's great research. Um, Dr. Guthrie is one of our people who most recently got a doctorate degree. And part of his research was on the fact that um, the research shows us that, that it's that challenge that means as much or more than what the grade is. It, the grade doesn't mean nearly as much or whether or not they got credit or whatever score they got on the AP exam doesn't matter as much as the fact that they challenged themselves. That's worth more in the end. And we're talking about challenging ourselves here and taking risks. So um, this is also the same. I want to move around. I don't know how to take this with me. Um, this is the same set of rules that says um, uh, weighted credit must um, exceed the standards of other courses. If we're going to ask for other courses to be weighted, they've got to be of an exceptional character. Um, this also says that some career and technical education courses, like computer science in our state now, those career and technical education courses can have, we can apply for them to have weighted credit. We were the first district that led the way on computer science, and now our state says that all computer science courses everywhere are weighted. And um, so they see the standard curriculum um, that you would have in another course, and or they have industry-recognized certifications. So on the next slide, this is what's kind of a new concept that not a lot of districts have taken advantage of in Arkansas, um, but we like to lead the way. And um, a local district um, can adopt a policy that gives weighted credit to other courses beyond IB and IP. And they might be CTE, they might not be. And um, college credit courses are one of the ones listed. A local board, if they adopt such a policy, we will then have to apply to DESE to get that approved. So your policy would not be the end all. It would have to, we would have an application next. And so on the next slide, these are the things that we would have to have in our application. We would have to describe how the course exceeds the expectations of other coursework. We would have to explain the grade levels that we would allow students to take that course in. Our book already does that, our catalog you have in your hand. We would have to say how that, um, Concurrent credit course is substantially the same as an advanced placement course. We would have to um, give a statement of learner outcomes and objectives, which the colleges we deal with already have. And um, we would have to describe the instructional strategies, demonstrating problem solving, critical thinking, and higher order thinking skills. So we have friends from NWAC and our partners that are online with us tonight. Some of them couldn't be here with us in person in the building. Um, but they have assured me that, A, um, they already have these things for their own accrediting bodies that they have to go through regularly. And um, they, the community colleges actually have maybe a little more rigorous accreditation process than some of the universities because they've got to prove that their credit is worthy to transfer to the university. And remember that the state of Arkansas assures us that certain community college credits will transfer to our four-year universities. There is um, an affirmation of that on certain courses. Um, so NWAC is um, ready to go forward with this with us and um, feels like they have a lot of this on hand and can do it with us very quickly. So on the next slide, um, that sets up our basis of this. Um, but I want to tell you a couple of stories and a couple of things that might help you think through what is the will of the board here? Um, this is a young lady I want you to meet. Her name is Abigail Hutchins. She's a freshman at BHS, and she took two college classes her first semester in high school, last semester, um, while she was also in the acapella choir. And um, she um, is working towards a full associate's degree while she's in high school, an academic associate's degree, which is about 20 courses or 60 college credit hours. And um, if you want to look on page 118 at the very back of this book you have in your hand, your catalog, page 118, that last example for your plan there for a student on page 118, the gray lines 
our college courses. And you're seeing two semesters there, one semester and then a slash and then another semester. And those are the college courses for a program like Abigail's. So you can see how um, Abigail actually was an overachiever because the student in the sample plan in your hand is only taking one college course per semester. Abigail took two in the fall of her freshman year. And um, that's about the max that I'm accustomed to a, a freshman doing. Um, this has become very popular around the country. Um, they call them early colleges um, south of here in a lot of states. And um, they call them, I think, middle colleges on the East Coast in several states. Um, but it's a very popular concept that universities are more and more accustomed to taking in these kinds of transfer credits with students coming right out of high school. So um, the next slide, um, I also want you to look at page 25 in this catalog with me. And page 25 just connects you back to the state's rules. And you can see there on page 25 that uniform grading scale. You can see where we've got the unweighted um, column and the weighted column listed there. Um, so just another place that connects us to the state's rules. Um, so three prompts here I have for myself to remember some examples for you. One is a local scholarship example. So let's say Abigail, back the kiddo on page 118. So let me look at the kiddo on page 118. Um, let's admire a couple other things. This kiddo on page 118 did not just take these concurrent college courses. This kiddo also took AP courses. You see that? This kiddo also has um, Spanish 4 or an internship. That's something I call triangulation that I've been um, recommending to families for 10 or 15 years now. And that is don't put all your eggs in the AP basket. Don't put all your eggs in the concurrent credit basket. Don't put all your eggs in the CTE um, career pathway um, internship basket, but triangulate and get a little bit of all of it um, because it makes you a better rounded student. And this example um, does just that, that you can see. Um, so in a local scholarship, um, we run quite a few local scholarships that some of you who've already had graduates through our schools understand. In um, January, February, your seniors might get a local scholarship packet. And all of these great community groups that want to offer scholarships just to BHS and Bentonville West students are going to let these students apply. And you might sit on the board of that scholarship that Amazing is going to get. And uh, you're looking there through all of these, and you're going to see a weighted GP. And Abigail, with her college associate's degree and 60 college credit hours, where she just saved $40,000 on the first two years of college, her GPA is never going to match that kid who did nothing but AP and IB or computer science, because that's where our weight is. That's where we put our value in the weight and the GPA, according to our current system. So while she's got a full 60 college credit hour associate's degree, um, you, if you are just sorting those applicants based on a weighted GPA number, you're going to overlook the worth and the value and the grit and the work ethic. Let's look at Abigail again. Um, she's working hard. <laughs> you're going to overlook this kid who's been an independent learner. She has set goals and she has worked with college professors, both online in that independent learning environment, um, as well as in person since her, she was 14. So um, we are shortchanging her a little in our current system. Um, if we'll go back, my next story um, to tell is early math, um, my other prompts. So my early math kid, and this is a real young man, I won't use his name um, because I don't know how to pronounce it, but, um, and you might would know it um, right away um, because he is still with us, but I got to working on his case about two years ago he was going into the 10th grade with us, and he had exhausted all of the math opportunities he needed with us. He needed higher level math than what we could give him by the time he was going to be in his sophomore and junior year with us. And so I worked with um, our departments, both at NWAC and at U of A, and decided what, and several math experts here on our team, and I said, what math 
um, should this young man, um, what should we recommend to him next at either NWAC, and this is way above college algebra. Um, college algebra isn't the only kind of math they might take and have a ghost case. Um, and this young man, um, we found him some courses at NWAC, but we found even more opportunities at U of A, and I had to um, share with his family. Um, you can look at the website for U of A, and it's called Non-Degree Seeking Students. That's the same as our dual credit students with NWAC. Um, we've got a really good price deal with NWAC on that concurrent credit. With U of A, it's a little more pricey for him to go take that class with them. And I recommend it to his family. These are your options. You can do this with us. You can do this with NWAC. You can do this with U of A. Think about if he takes those upper-level math courses at U of A. He transfers them back in here. They would not get weighted credit. It wasn't AP, it wasn't IB, and it wasn't computer science. And even though he's taking upper level math at U of A, but as far above the math I ever took for a bachelor's of science in history, um, he's not going to get weighted credit. And that's so sad. <laughs> um, I don't have a recommendation for you, but I'm showing my bias on that. <laughs> um, so if you'll show me one more thing here, Aaron, I had another prompt on the last slide. I've missed, maybe? you'll get back to um, core questions. So some of our core questions here are going to be, um, are these college classes our students are taking, are they really um, as rigorous or more rigorous than the high school class that crosswalk to? For example, our students, in Abigail's case, she has a choice of taking health with our teachers or taking the health and wellness um, with NWAC. And I have someone on our staff who recently said, my son just took that course and I promise you, and they could walk us through the rigor and the challenge and the things that that student encountered in that experience. And so um, these college classes are certainly more rigorous than the courses we're crosswalking them to. Now, are there times when I'm gonna find an easier college professor? Absolutely. And that's gonna happen for me at Baylor, at U of A, at in WAC no matter where I go. And there's times that's gonna happen in our own campus. Um, some of us are easier than others. Some of us are the right personality or the right kind of work um, process for one student and it doesn't fit for every student. And some teachers um, fit for one but not the other. There's no one answer to all of that. And, and that's a good thing. We've got a lot of different kinds of kids. Um, so we know um, that sometimes you can take a class at NWAC that's going to be easier but we also know that it's meeting a higher standard. I'll give you an example about their certifications um, and these teachers who are teaching for NWAC, whether they're our employee or NWAC's employee. I am technically qualified. I have um, a certification for the state of Arkansas in history and social studies, grades seven through 12. I am technically qualified to teach your child AP economics, AP government, AP world history, AP American history, AP Human Geography, AP Sociology, and I, there might be two more I can't even name and remember. It, there's no secret that I'm not really truly qualified to be an expert in all of those. I could not teach the college version of any of those classes for NWAC or on our campus, and that's because I don't have 18 hours in economics alone, 18 graduate level hours in U.S. history alone, 18 graduate level hours in um, world history alone, because my graduate level hours are in education. Um, so while I'm not qualified to do what that NWAC professor is doing, they no doubt have an opportunity sometimes to go into more depth than I could for you. Now, I would put any AP teacher we have in our schools um, ahead of me any day. They're all better than I am at what they do. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not comparing that, but we do want to elevate this college experience for what it is. Um, so on this next slide, um, we have a committee that makes recommendations to you about the course catalog, about rules and regulations with GPAs, and um, all of the calculations, all of the transfer credit, and we bring that committee together several times a year. They are, it's made up of high school principals, assistant principals, master schedulers, um, counselors, um, people of that nature. Um, our high school district registrar is in there. And um, they met recently to give us their input on this. And this is a summary. I've got three pages of notes that I took as each one of them commented. And in general, they say college coursework experiences help students learn skills and build confidence 
for either the workforce certifications they need next or the university enrollment programs they need next. Um, there's a certain level of confidence, we call that college knowledge, that they learn by experiencing life with a college professor. They learn about a syllabus. They learn about the bursar's office. That was the most stressful place I ever dealt with in college. They learn about the college processes. Um, waiting credit for college courses will remove a deterrent to early college enrollment and cost savings. So currently we have a deterrent because families know I'm not gonna get the weighted credit. I'm not going to be as competitive with that community scholarship. Um, I might not be as competitive in some other ways because I'm not gonna have the weighted credit. So I'm not going to go down this road where I could save $40,000. And um, we don't want all of that debt later in life. Um, waiting credit. For college courses will give these students an added benefit for the added challenge um, that they've chosen over regular coursework on our campus. And um, so those are the thoughts of our committee. Um, that's all I have for you and I can entertain your questions. Or Thank you for that. And I guess you led into one of my questions, um, which was, I, the thought process here is AP and IB courses are more challenging, more rigorous, but so are the college courses. That was the initial, so the initial thought process, whenever waiting was put in place in many places many, many years ago at this point, um, was that AP and IB were more rigorous. At that point, you had very little dual credit offering. And now that dual credit has emerged, you might need to stop and make but yes, um, that was the original concept. Um, but there are people who would argue that this is also a challenge students are taking. It's certainly more challenging than our on-level option those students had. And sometimes it's as challenging or more challenging than any AP or IB course. And you kind of touched on it with the certifications that NWAC goes through for teaching. But how are we going to ensure that it's more rigorous? What's, what are we going to well, do? Well, the same way we ensure that um, my 15 Algebra One teachers all have the same level of um, guaranteed curriculum and instruction. Um, we've got to monitor it. We've got to be in the middle of it. We've got to constantly work with our partners, um, like Arkansas State offers some of these for us right now, and NWAC and U of A or whoever that might be. And some of that is controlled by the college partner. They have the same semester exam that they have in college, and so some of and they have to use the syllabus from the college, or there are certain things that are required from the college. So it, you have that other body governing it. Now, I can tell you, we have to submit these course by course, and just because it's college credit, they won't approve all of them. And so I don't think we'll be in a place where we can say all college credit. That's just the reality. They will feel like they need to reject some of them. Um, but it will be a course by course. And I still feel like if we can do that much for kids, kids come out ahead. Just think walking in Wendy's class and those kids passing those certifications, their CNA, phlebotomy or something. I'm much more concerned as a mom coming home. Did you pass your CNA? That I am. What's your grade in that class? Grades really aren't the big thing, but to kids, when you're talking about class rank and GPA, it still matters. It still matters on scholarships, and so that's why we're going this. We're recommending that we go this route. Has anybody in the state done this yet? Yes, um, the, the Arkansas School of Math and Science. When I was at the Department of Ed, had some weighted credit. It's sparse. It's limited across the state, and I just think the door hasn't been open. I think once we go there and we put the work in and fight the fight to try to get the weighted credit. Um, other districts, other schools will go there as well. Two of the so districts I, that are doing it that I've talked with are Berryville and Omaha. Um, and then you've got the School of Math and Science. Because if I'm the state, my, my question is, how do I quantify it? I mean, with an AP exam, you can quantify it, right? It's a national exam that's given out. You score some particular level on it. I'm just curious how they quantify an well, a English teacher at NWAC that they've never seen teach. or 
You know what I'm saying? I do, the but they quantify form? AP by AP has to have an approved syllabus. Correct. And so does so do college classes. The classes that we have and give college credit, so they look at the syllabus. AP has to have a certain amount of training for the teacher. There are certain requirements on the teacher of college credit classes that 18 specialized hours in their degree. So it's using the same method by which they're approving AP for IB teachers. They, yeah, they don't but, all earn credit. They don't all, so part of the, just the grading system of the college, um, they're not all successful at it. Um, and so that helps quantify it on some level too. Um, but one of the things that Berry Hill and Omaha found was that um, AP credit, and this is something our committee talked about, AP credit is maybe college credit. It depends on the institution. It, yeah. it depends on the score you get. At right. the end, and then it's going to depend on the institution. And they found they had um, less and less success with institutions taking it because some institutions only want the five or the four and the five. And um, this is real college credit on a real college transcript. Well, they may be taking it at some college or not. Not all junior college credits are taken at universities. So either, the so. state of Arkansas's Higher Education Learning Board. Um, confirms that the core credits coming out of their community colleges will transfer to their four-year schools. Arkansas, and you're going to find very good um, reciprocity with that in state schools in um, our surrounding areas. I've had very good experience with that from Texas community colleges to um, Oklahoma and Louisiana and Arkansas. And you can look ahead of time, and we teach our counselors and our students how to look at that transfer page on that university's website and you can see if this math I've chosen or this biology I've chosen is going to transfer to my particular degree program. Um, so um, there are ways to do that. I'll tell you, Baylor is a great private school that will take community college transfer credit and does a very good job at honoring that. Rice is a great private school that's going to want you to pay into it all their way. So I guess my question is, are we... I mean, I had no problem with, with going on this road. But they asked for in a portal. So they asked for certain pieces of information to quantify it. So those, and they have a committee that rules on that. Is that each each year you'll submit that? No, it will. Um, once you get an approval, it's good until the standards change or the situation changes. There was a slide where there were about five bubbles. The five things, these are the five things we have to turn in. A couple other questions. Should there be any concern that it will pull from the IB and AP? That's Test an interesting and question. And, and I can't help but saying logically yes, but let me give you a reason to say maybe not. Um, Five years ago, our per semester enrollment with MWAC was a couple hundred students. And now it is, I want to say, 1,326 enrollments per semester this year. It has um, grown, I think that was eight times is what we figured out. Um, but um, in that same time period, um, if I asked you, what do you think the AP enrollment did? at our two high schools, it's actually gone up at the same time. Um, part of that is our population's always expanding too. Um, and you will see, if you look at it, a little blip with BHS, but that's the blip where BHS lost students. And so their enrollment looks like it went down, but that's the students just moved. They showed up in the other chart for BHS in the West. Um, but our AP enrollment has actually gone up or, or stayed stable over those five years. Um, when we have increased monumentally our enrollment with NWAC. Um, There's a cost associated with AP and IB for the district to have those programs? Um, so AP, the state no, funds. other than training, because AP, and there's a reason behind it, we're an AP state, and the state has taken on the cost of that. They pay for our tests. Do test cost? Absolutely but they're taking that on. IB, we do have cost involved. And we are not proposing this to weaken AP and IB programs because we thoroughly believe in AP, especially AP and IB for kids. But 
you also can't have these kinds of programs CTE and say they're not work they're not as rigorous as AP and IB classes. Um, one of our partners from NYX said it best and he said that we're, we're not here to minimize AP at all we, we want to elevate the college credit that is already real college credit. Um, AP is supposed to simulate college credit but the thing that is real college credit isn't getting the weight and some members of our com committee found that um, a little interesting. Um, I, I came out of the early college programs, um, the five or eight years prior to me coming here, I was working in some of those programs in Texas, and um, the people that I found that needed early college programs the most were um, teachers, our school resource officers and police officers. Um, they were people who um, made too much money to get some of the financial aid help they needed to put their kids through college or through certification programs, but they didn't make enough to really afford it for several kids in their household. And so they found that these programs where you can save $40,000 on the first two years of college, but still go to U of A and have a Razorback diploma on your wall the rest of your life, um, that was a really good way for them to segue their students in. What is the maximum number of concurrent credits a student can earn at BHS and graduate? The maximum number of concurrent credits uh -huh. that you can earn would be 60-ish um, because they get a full associate's degree. We've had several do it, I'm about thinking, one a year for a while. High school credits. There's so many credits you have to earn to graduate, right? And so I'm just... Well, yeah, yeah. So I mean, concurrent classes. So if you're English, you're taking English one or whatever it would be. I mean, theoretically, there are twenty classes you could take for concurrent credit. Right, but do we maximize the number? Of, uh, can we say, okay, you can only take ten total and graduate from Benville schools? No. Do we limit we them? Right. No. So theoretically, a student could go take. I'm just saying, we don't have a limit. You could take two classes at the high school, take the rest at Menwag, and still graduate from Benville High School and come out with. So many hours from. I think so. I don't think there's anything that would. So we have young ladies already. One of them is at Harvard. Um, she went through school with us all four years, but she graduated with an associate's degree from NWAC. So she had 20 courses, 60 credit hours. She may not have needed to transfer all 60 of those credit hours to our transcript. You don't always. You, it doesn't. You may not need it because it's an extra elective over there. But you've already fulfilled your electives over here. For it's just interesting. I, I'm just curious. I've never really thought about a high school I know, student. but that's something to think about, too. Because with everything, you have to think about unintended consequences. Yeah, because eventually you could have that one student. That well, says, everything oh, has to be approved to go on your high school transcript. Those counselors right. take it in and say, oh, you can take this in place of this. But um, that's something that to think about. What are some that I've thought about, you know, we are, when we look at the top 10 students, think of the students you see on stage. It's kids that have taken like AP, yeah. as many AP as they could get. Um, that would look different. Yeah, so the valedictorian of all the schools in NY, or Northwest Arkansas probably took a full load of AP courses. It's usually around um, 17 to 22 that a valedictorian is going to have taken in either IB or AP. Which is interesting because that number very closely mirrors the 20 courses you might would take for a full associate's degree. And I will say this in my mind, I don't think that we would put every one of our concurrent credits through and ask for weighted credit. If we don't feel like it's rigorous enough to get weighted credit, I don't think we'd waste our time doing that. Yeah, that, that was kind of my question. I mean, are we going to just go and ask for all of it or just cherry pick? Exactly I haven't what? asked that question. And and that includes a lot of the principals and everything. I'd get some. I wouldn't think if you look at some classes, you can take college level health or college level PE, right? You can. And um, I I don't think there's so much. So my those. question to that is, you know, the 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 manpower that's going to take to ask for this um, and make sure that we're not exhausting our staff and and over um, putting constraints on them. To, to ask for that. I, I mean, I, I don't know what the weight, I don't know what the lift is, but I mean, if we got to hit all those bullet points, um, there's going to be time. 
That's put where um, NWAC has most of this already packaged for their accreditations. And so we actually think um, it, it's a pretty mild venture um, because it would be, we would divide and conquer. For example, our curriculum specialist for English, Sean Quinlan, she would handle the ones for Comp 1 and Comp 2. And I think that leads into my next follow up question is what kind of partnership are we going to get from our colleges that are going to partner with us to? to this happens and, and on that can we put a little pressure on uh university of arkansas if we're gonna uh, maybe get a little better price point uh with them if we're gonna allow for uh, these concurrent credits i mean it seems like we should be able to kind of use a little bit of our our push that gets um into a little bit of the politics of the territories because we're in essentially in wax territory right um and so um, oh, that's it. where I, we're supposed to be getting that I completely understand that, but it seems like it would be a at least an ask that yeah. we could go to the University of Arkansas. We are, we are certainly, that. for example, doing some great business with Arkansas State University, and they've been great to work with, but that's because they offer some swift computer science coding courses that the state is funding, and um, we have some students doing very well in that. That was one of the things I was thinking about, too, was that there's a uh, paralegal studies certificate given by NY well which if we're talking about strands um, you want us to start a lawyer strand i'm not saying that I mean, there's lots of people that support lawyers in their jobs <laughs> and need to, trust me. Are you, there's a yeah, great high here. school with a courtroom oh, yeah, built sure. in <laughs> we have to travel around the, around the state to find people and it's very hard to find people oh the qualified. paralegal yeah. i'm with you and, yeah. and trust me, you try it before you buy it. If you, if you get them and you love it, then great. If you don't love it, then you're right. right. not before you went and spent $100,000 on going to law school. Um, Which is probably not even Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Where did, maybe I missed it. Where would the Ignite classes? I guess there's some that get college credits. That's how we're going to pull in. So every the, Ignite strand has one or more college courses okay. built in. And those would be some of the courses that we would entertain. Or submission. Okay. And then finally, Dr. Jones hit on it, unintended consequences, you know, just kind of thinking through the why not. Why wouldn't we want to do this? Has anybody done it and found out that it's not that? I, I can't think in this 30 minute conversation why we wouldn't. It seems to make sense if you select the right courses. It, it is um, changing something that's been in place a very long time. It's changing a system that we've all um, been trained and raised to believe in AP and that that the only way um, and so it's certainly a strong challenge to the status quo you've certainly um, got um, AP teachers who would be um, very vested and very concerned about your question about how would enrollment drop um, again I'm not here to um, sell a family any one brand we want them to triangulate and to get the best of AP IB college credit career pathways internships and all of those things. Um, somebody in our committee said it very well, um, and I think it was um, Josh Vest. He said, doing what is best for kids, we should not worry about the brand, AP or college, we should encourage eating. Board, any other questions for Dr. Morrow or anyone that we've heard tonight? Thank you very much. This has been good. I always am encouraged when I come to Ignite and um, a little jealous that this wasn't a program when I was at VHS uh, in 2000. So um, I, I can't come back and, and take any of these drone classes. So I'll have to go take them at the U of A, I guess. So. <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> so when will we be? about this next steps um process this and then over the next few days as you have questions or weeks as you have questions uh call me if we want to go have lunch individually not together um then we can talk through any concerns you might have something that we need to follow up on if you have other unintended consequences that might arrive certainly we'll appreciate that input um we'll follow up with individual discussion 
um, and then pro strand by strand, um, we'll bring forward as we need action. For example, um, we would need some policy with this particular one. We would bring policy to the board for action. And the process to apply for this credit we thought would start right around March. And so we'll bring policy before that. It'll come before the board. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> we've been talking to college admissions people about just different things. And it's interesting what universities are now looking at for admissions versus what they were looking at uh, 10 years ago. And it seems as though the grade point average is not nearly, our test scores are not nearly as much as you know, what courses you've taken, how you performed in those particular courses, the diversity of your courses you've taken. Those things seem to be weighed, being weighed much more heavily than they used to be weighed. Um, which becomes much more subjective, I think, for for admission for kids uh, to, to significant, to larger universities, more prestigious larger universities. Um, so I'm just something I'm, I think is, is interesting. I'm just curious how this would weigh into that. That committee that she spoke of is that conversation. They've had a lot of that conversation. Um, and um, we can go further into that ranking, whether ranking should really be there or not. But we do have a committee, the high school committee, that meets and discusses those. They're on top of what schools require for admittance. Because it's not across the board, they don't require where we don't have all colleges that don't require an ACT score anymore, or those certain things. We still offer all those things. Um, and in some ways, in our ranking, we're very traditional. But they've had discussions about that. Is, is part of the discussion where they like reach out to like admission boards to like, yes, it is. to like a Vanderbilt or to a University of Chicago and yes. UCLA, that sort of thing, and say, OK, I know that there's, there's, a, there's a stigma of being in Arkansas, right? That you're in Arkansas, you're in 44th of education or whatever it is, and, um, you know, it's so I'm just curious how you get past that for the kids that want to leave the state of Arkansas and go to some of those other universities elsewhere and have a, a great chance to get in and also be able to have the, you know, we know they're going to perform well, right? but get in the door too. Right. It's just been in the last three years that they have, that committee would, they split it up and they reached out to different universities to get just that information. And I know kids that have been very interested in Ignite, in Ignite, and were done great in Ignite, um, and specifically did not try to go to the program because they knew it would hurt their grade point average, and they thought it would hurt them into getting into universities they wanted to go to. So, I mean, I got no issue at all when I was trying to promote, just me, you know, trying to promote that as getting the designation should get as far as grade point weighted. So, just me tossing that out there. Um, I don't know how everyone else feels. Um, makes sense to me. If we start this and get the okay to do this from the state, how fast is it? That's going to be part of the policy because we'll have to think through that. Do we start with the ninth grade incoming class? So um, it's not like a retroactive. Any kids that are still current students, do you don't yeah, get to. There, there has to be lots of process, and that'll come through the policy. And those, y'all will make that final decision. As far as voting on money for like, for example, retrofitting here when, i'm sorry as far as, as far as like the voting on retrofitting here um that's part of the question do we feel like we um of course would have a little bit more of a presentation but we would bring before we started the work on the construction building um this room then and that would need to come probably next month definitely on this room uh then was it, did it, it all add up to about $2 million? Like yes. Quick math. Yeah. So I just want to know how that fits in the budget. Well, uh, she, we happen to have a, <laughs> she has we, a, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. We do have an Excel sheet because no, you'd love, we knew you'd love it. She knew I was going to ask for this. <laughs> and it's really a good explanation. We love it. Every yeah. amount of money we spend has an impact. How do you like for my introduction, yeah. Janet? I have mine. I think, um, I think it's most important about the Excel spreadsheet that 
11 by 18. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> our building fund. This is the bottom half and the very top of our 10-year plan that we present to you each October. To orient you really quickly on the left are each of our projects. Across the top is each year. And then, for example, those first several projects we plan to do in 2021-22. So you can see the amount in that column, right? So this is a, a sample. I, anytime we look at a building fund project, we plug it into this spreadsheet, just like I've done for the projects that were presented tonight. So you'll see in bold, Ignite Construction, $1.5 million, and Ignite Medical, seventy-four five hundred. We plug it into this spreadsheet, and then we look how it impacts our building fund. So if you go to the bottom of your sheet, you can see the beginning balance each year for the building fund, what bond proceeds we expect to receive, partnership funding, and any savings that we have from the operating fund, you'll remember when we prepared our last 10-year plan that our goal was to set aside some savings every year from the operating fund to put into the building fund if, with the hopes of being able to build more schools than we had promised our voters. And the very last line there, the last line on the white row says we subtract the total expense. And then on the green line, you see our ending balance. This ending balance on the green line assumes that however much we decided to set aside from our operating fund into savings, we were able to set aside all of it. So whatever we planned, we actually did set aside. And if you notice, I've added these two projects in and you'll see the ending balance. It takes us all the way out to the 26-27 school year. And you see that's the first year we go negative. And remember we talked about at our 10-year plan that that would be the point where we would have to go and request an additional millage or some other financial support. It could be a, um, we could refinance our, our debt. We would have to do something in order to be able to get to 26, 27. So that's in green. The yellow line shows, well, what if we weren't able to save all of our operating funds that we had planned to set aside? We only saved half. And if that happened, then you can see we would still get to 26, 27. The difference is, is whatever we did, whether it be a millage request or a refinance, it would have to generate more funds than before. And then the final line, the orange red line shows what would happen if we didn't save any of our operating funds and trans transfer those to the building fund at the end. And you'll notice, and that's our worst case scenario. And if that were to happen and we did complete the two um, additional projects in bold, we would run out of funds in 23, 24. So this does a couple of things for us. When we put it into this, spree this spreadsheet and we use this level of planning, it allows us to direct our funds to what is most important and most impactful for students. We can make those judgment calls because we can see very clearly how this will impact our building fund budget. It allows us to be nimble and responsive. You, I'm sure, learned from our last October, October 1 session we are able to identify needs that we know are coming up. We know that in 14 years, we're going to have to replace the turf at Bentonville High School. So we add those to our plan, but we make changes to this plan throughout the year and every year for the current year and even the next year. And because we plan at this level, we're able to be nimble. So we found out that we need to, to ch make changes to Ignite. We are able to be nimble and put that into the budget. And last but not least, this kind of planning reminds us that every funding decision we make, even if it's not in the building fund, impacts where we land in the building fund. So every bonus, every salary increase, every um, purchase of a large piece of equipment out of operating fund has the potential to impact the amount of savings we then transfer to the building fund at the end. So that's a nice reminder for us. So this is our financial plan. If you were to approve it, um, you can see that as, unless we refuse to save at all, we'll, it'll, it'll end well for us. Uh, question. Maybe a little off topic, but as we're looking at things a long ways out, do we, and as we've learned in the last year, um, inflation can crop up on us quickly. Um, 
Is there any planning for that in some of these? Every one of these prices is priced out at what we would expect it to be today. And then a four and a half percent increase. We moved it to four and a half year over year. Yeah, because minimum West was what, 85 million? Yes. And <clears throat> yes, and the got projection our... here is 141 million. Yes. We have to be prepared for that. Good bids back on that. Okay, so had, uh, next steps. Yes. I had a quick question. Okay. It's kind of going back a few steps, but I just it takes me a while to think about things. I'm kind of a slow processor. Um, but one of the things that um, so, so how do we develop these partnerships with with um, with our ignite program? Like, is that with our ignite program? Yeah, like work with Mercy and folks that we is that just like a kind it's of really the individual and... teachers um wendy has and teresa they're constantly out in the community they reach out to make partners uh jessica working with uh the aeronautics groups really and teresa they started all that it's just constantly reaching out being in the community yeah and Teresa is one of the best people I know to go ask for things directly, and they never knew that she asked, and they just give her stuff. So I guess the the reason I ask is so it seems like with Mr. Weeks, um, he's got all sorts of like from talking, Context. To him, yeah, everybody, yeah. everybody wants his kids right. doing something for him, right? Um. But from what it sounded like tonight, his is more of a struggle of attracting the kids, you know, I mean, into the program and kind of getting them to see that vision, right? And it seems like with the medical side, we've got all sorts of kids wanting to get in. But it seems like to getting, finding just enough, you know, Mercy can only take so many kids. And all, all those things. So I'm just, I guess, trying to, I just want to make sure we have, is, and and from what it sounds like, our partners, it's a great deal for them because they're getting employees in the future and they're getting some, sounds like free labor <laughs> while they're there, you know. I mean, is there any way we can, as we're about to invest, you know, $2 million into this, is there any way... And I know we've, we're kind of in that phase of building up our credibility with like a Mercy or whoever. And then, you know, one student getting on their phone kind of hurts that. But is there any way we can create any kind of guarantees or like contracts with like, a, so like say Mercy can say, look, we're about to double our space for this program. Can we get some guarantees that we will have X number of you know, internships or opportunities or, you know, days to come visit type thing. Is that, is that a possibility? I don't think that's a realistic possibility because, okay. they don't, for example, right now, COVID, they need to hire everyone they can, but they can't predict right. next year. And um, I just feel like they have done such an excellent job of building relationships with those partners that they have. They're doing, they will do everything they can to take care it's really about the relationship more than anything else, I would say. Uh huh. Yeah.
I just, I, I, I am like a huge fan. You know, obviously I'm the new guy, but you know, between seeing this and seeing what Mr. Weeks is doing, I'm all for. I just want to make sure that our kids, we're not going to like expand and then have. You know, I want to make sure these kids are going to have places to go see it. For sure. I don't know. You know, that's go why, go get their experience. I guess. And that's why they're very deliberate and thoughtful about expansion. Yeah. Even. Yeah, very yeah. small. Yeah, I, I would think it's just a goodwill consideration. I mean, you know, just being for me, and and this is I probably have said this before, and so I'll say it again. But I mean, the end result is we want our students to be able to get the understanding that they need to get back to local community, and so working with local partners, I think, is, is vital. Um, and and the, the at the beginning of the ignite program, that was the whole point of it was just to get our students the opportunity to be out in the community and and build that goodwill with our community partnerships. Um, so I get your point, Mike. I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, obviously, if we can get them to write a check and uh, and support us, that would be great. Um, but in my way of looking at it, it feels like in in a lot of ways they're they're doing that by just allowing us the access to their space. Um, so that's already done. Um, so I think we we would risk, you know, maybe hampering those relationships a little bit if we begin to kind of expect money uh, from them beyond what they're already giving to us. So um, you know, our, our tax dollars are are supporting um, the the educational base, and so um, being able to give back to our our local uh, partners, business partners, and, and stakeholders. Is, is what's vital to me um, in, in this seat. And so I love the partnerships we've built. Um, I think I think we can even do more, um, but dollars are always the constraints, right? I, I, I wasn't, my head wasn't going towards dollars per se. It's more of, you know, I, if we're going to expand the number of kids, I want to make sure that those kids have a good, like, you know, a nurse that they can go shadow for the day type of thing. I, I guess that was, I wasn't, Thinking the dollars. Thinking well, certainly something to bring up in your network. I think uh, I ran into Toby Teeter, who's running the collaborative, and I was like, you need to meet our Ignite group. And he's like, oh, is that Miss Hudson? I was like, yes. He's like, I already have. I was like, great. <laughs> so when you hear those opportunities, I think, Matt, you bringing up the, the paralegal, that's, that's something definitely to consider. It seems like there could be a, a demand for that. So that's as a board and, and just the community in general. It's being proud of this program. We all should be. The community should be. We should as board members. You all should be as the, the staff that's leading it. And we should be talking about it when the time's appropriate and advancing opportunities for Ms. Hudson and her, her team to have those opportunities. Because I would like to see this to continue to grow. But there's things we need. We need funding. We need uh, opportunities for the kids. And so the one thing I've never seen, I think, Brent, you may have been a part of this, is where, who else is doing this in the country? Who's doing it really well? And is there anything we can learn from them? I've never seen another program. This is the only Ignite program I've seen. So I just assume we're the best in the country. I don't know if that's right, but uh, oh, we may. Sure. I may need more data or information on that at some point in time. So well, we'll I think we, we are. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can always, as we look towards the future and possibly a third high school, over the next few years, we need to make those visits and put our vision together of what that really looks like. And there are places doing incredible things where they have these types of focused high schools. And so that's in our future. That's great. Hey, Debbie, have you ever seen the original presentation that was done to the board related to the original strands of the proposed or whatever we call the program that is actually? I have tons of Ignite presentations back to the very beginning. It started in 1516 with 16 kids in IT, and I came February 1 of 2016. And we went to CAPS, we made those visits, and so I'm very familiar with the beginning. With the I'm beginning. just curious, because I don't recall. I sat through those. I'm just curious, what was the original laundry list of strands? IT was the first one and only one. In right, that was one that was approved, but when, when it was, when Brent went up to Blue, Spur, or Blue Valley, and spent a couple trips up there. Mike came back with oh. a list of like 
16 or 18 strands. I mean, just, I don't know what it was. It was I do. I remember that because I was, this was years ago, but um, I would bring teams up to Bentonville from Bryant to steal certain things. And he showed us his <laughs> plan. When my whole team was at the hotel, he showed us the whole plan for all of this. So, yes, uh, I do. He probably. Uh, yep. Yeah, it was. Uh huh. He probably wrote down on a napkin. No, no, no. He had a fancy. <laughs> We can do it both ways, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. I, but, I, I was just curious what, what was on there that we don't do. And I, you know, we've had the conversation about, you know, that this has to evolve as the marketplace evolves and, and needs to become more prevalent. I'm curious what the thought was 10 years ago, or you know, what you thought was relevant. I bet then. we can put our hands on that. So I'm curious if we look at that now and say, well, this boat there, mm -hmm. we really needed this. I'm just curious because, you know, sometimes looking back, you know, it's a little bit. Yep. I'll try to put my hands on that. Seems that there's lots of support. Um, we'll look for more information in the, the coming board meetings. There's not an official board member comment, but I'll, I'll leave it open just for a second so I don't cut anybody off if you had a last second comment. No, I, I echo what Matt just said. I think it would be interesting to go back and see kind of that original um, grouping of, of those bullets, or puzzle pieces or whatever. I remember kind of the presentation, but it'd be interesting to go back and kind of see what those were. And I also want to be mindful that, that maybe we're not leapfrogging over something that we maybe need to go back and revisit. Uh, and think well, maybe we need to pause and say we should go into that rather than, you know, and not to not to say the aviation is not the place we want to go, but maybe we need to go back and revisit and see if there's not Community, community partners that might have felt like we were giving them a nod that we we're going to support something for them that maybe we're letting them down by saying we we're not doing that now and, and we're going to go do this thing. So um, I think it would be important before we you know steamroll ahead that we kind of level level set and go back and kind of re revisit what we what we've explored in the past. So good point, Matt. Um, that's the only thing I would add. I think it's interesting. The I forget what it was called the, the, the elevated grade point average. What do we call weighted. it? Weighted credit. Weighted credit. Um, because I think the board of maybe it's like a topic not discussed because they can infer that it's been discussed that maybe it's weighted credit instead of credit. Um, yeah. I, I can see a family that has been cooperating with them and they have to be a great competitive relationship or whatever. It's not even important to say that they can they can use any course that they possibly could to analyze and try to find that out instead of just doing it by the highest grade point average possible or the highest grade point average. I I just think I I just think it's I I think it's also so better that they have a highest grade point average. It's I you know it's it's where's the balance? That'll have to be a consideration in the policy. I'm just going to say, you know, I, uh, I, I graduated with 20 kids in the middle of nowhere. And, and then I know I'm the new guy. And so I'm not like anything I've asked tonight is uh, like, I'm just trying to learn and like, I'm not trying to, but, um, I just think what is going on here is incredible. And I think just applaud everybody here who has done all this work the rest of the board and you know everybody here I, it's it's incredible and i keep saying it but i was like i really think we should this should be like a on the a marketing poster for you know every high school in america it should be seeing what, what's being done here i think it's i think our economy needs it i think what we're doing especially with like what mr weeks is doing i mean we need that everywhere um so and kids need to see you know what opportunities there are um so yeah just uh thank you all for what you're doing this is it, it's amazing to see it so. hey Teresa, do we do we still have a pretty good engagement with the caps network uh and so yeah yeah and and i don't know if you've looked at that um kelly but you know just exploring the caps network and just going out there and seeing these other schools 
I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, I remember, you know, it was jaw dropping just uh, a few years ago when I when I originally looked at it and was, we were exploring uh, getting uh, Ignite kind of kicked off. Of course, at that time it wasn't Ignite. It was just this thing that we were trying to create. Um, it became Ignite. Uh, but um, the CAPS network, I mean, there's, there's just a wealth of great ideas. Uh, schools doing some really innovative things in their local communities uh, that and giving back to the community and, and building great partnerships. So um, anyway, something to definitely explore. And if Mike, if you haven't um, looked at it, I think it's worth your, your time to spend 15, 20 minutes and explore the, the CAPS network. Thank you for that. I've got two things. The whole Ignite program, I'm kind of like Kelly. When I came into this, this, I went home telling my family, holy crap, this place is awesome. Like this whole <laughs> building is amazing. The whole programs, there's nothing negative that I can even begin to try to find about Ignite. Um, I would love to see expanded, even like you said, about getting more strands. I mean, I'm, I'm in the social sciences. I would love to see somehow social science at strand. You know, my, some of my girls are going that route, and we don't have a route for that in, in Bentonville. So um, that would be the only suggestion. But as on another topic we've talked about tonight, as a um, psychologist with weighted credits and concurrent credits, um, we do have kids who are um, geared for that. And we've got kids who will strive to that that will socially hurt themselves. And so you touched on it, Matt, you touched on it. I think we need to be very intentional about what does that look like when we open this up with you've got a 16-year-old kid who's going to start as a junior in college, and how does that socially affect them? Because um, they miss out on all the freshman experiences and all the age group appropriate relationships. So I do just want us to be mindful of that as we pursue this and what it looks like when we open it up so they get a lot more credits to start out in. Um, because it could have on, on several kids a negative impact if we did it irresponsibly. So that's just my two cents on the flip side of the coin. I think it's an amazing opportunity to have, I mean, my kids, my kids are taking it right now. My daughter, my junior's taking two, three, four, three college credits this, this year. So not in any way opposed to that, but I do want us to be mindful and make sure that we pay attention to whatever our criteria will be to let kids open up to that part of it all. Very good point. Thank you. Anything else for Dr. Jones? Okay, guys. I think uh, that was been a, this has been a very productive uh, meeting. And again, I'll, I'll say it: we always get encouragement coming visiting the night group. It's always fun. I will take a motion to adjourn. Motion and a second. second. All in favor? All right. Thank you all very much. All have a great evening. <laughs>